The Raspberry Pi is one of the best boards you can use to learn embedded programming. In minutes, you can have Linux on this thing and use it for your next IoT or embedded project. But in this video, we are going to do a Blink LED entirely in Rust with no Linux. Yep, you heard me right. No operating system, no Linux, just pure bare metal Rust. The way we'll do this is we'll write a custom kernel in Rust that is flat and runs bare metal put it on the Raspberry Pi and then use that to blink an LED. You can take this code further to do UART communication or maybe even write your own kernel for your own OS written completely in Rust. Let's get started. For the video today, we'll be using the Raspberry Pi 3 Model B. Uh, we'll have an LED hung off of pin 21, GPIO pin 21, and then we'll use that with a 470 ohm resistor to tie back into ground on the Raspberry Pi. Okay, so to get started, we'll have to first make our cargo project. Again, my assumption here is you have Rust installed, you have Rust up installed, and you can use cargo to create projects, right? So we're gonna say cargo new, we'll do my Rusty Pi. And we'll CD into that application real quick, and then we'll code this directory, opening it up. Uh, this will show us that we have a few things created by default by the Rust, you know, cargo manager. Um, we have the cargo file here and our main source code file. So if we do basic things like cargo build, we'll build our project and we'll get a target binary built for the uh, the Linux environment we have running. So a few things wrong with that. First, we don't want to use Linux A, and then B, we don't want to use the x86 Intel processor, right? So to change the processor to the ARM chip that is based in the Raspberry Pi, uh, we have to do a few things. So we're going to make a folder called dot cargo. And then inside that file, we are going to make a actually let's do touch config. It's a config file. You'll see that appear here in code. And then to add the ARM build chain, we'll say for the build phase, the target is always the ARM V7A none. The none means there's no underlying operating system. And then the extended ABI for the hardware. So this will say by default, we build for the ARM toolchain V7, which is 32 bit. Awesome. So if we go back and we try to build again, we'll actually run into a lot of issues. So what's going on here is the code is written for the Linux environment using the standard library, but the build chain is not. So we have to modify this code pretty heavily to make sure that the code is designed for the embedded platform. So we'll delete all this code. We'll do a few things to start. So step one, if you're doing any embedded Rust, you have to do the no standard line. This means essentially it tells the Rust compiler, hey, don't incorporate the standard library, do completely bare metal code. And then also we're gonna do no main. So no main, what that does is it tells the Rust compiler, we are not gonna use the main function as our entry point. We are going to take care of the entry point ourselves. And that's kind of a bigger part of this video is making sure that the code is organized in a way that our start function gets ran first. We're going to use the function start as our entry point. It's going to return nothing. And to confirm that to the compiler, we have to do an infinite loop at the end. So this means return nothing, it never returns. And we loop forever to confirm that. Also, we need to make sure that the start symbol is globally accessible, meaning the linker can see it at link time to make sure that it's ordered the right way. The way we do that is we say that it's a public function and also it's an extern C, which means we expose that symbol to the linker. And to make sure that the name is manageable, we say no mangle, because by default, it might mangle this name. We wanna make sure that in the link environment, the symbol name is start. Okay, awesome. So we can also do is try to build again. We'll probably get a panic handler error. So to make the processor happy, we have to provide a handler for the processor to use if it goes into a panic state. So like a hard fault, a soft fault, a bus error, stuff like that. So we are going to create our panic handler here and we'll describe it with the panic handler option here. So the function is called, uh, not public, it's called panic. It takes a reference to a panic info type it also does not return and to make the compiler happy we will also just infinitely loop here you know in theory you could do some kind of debug output with the console but we're not going to deal with that uh, we have to actually include this type as well so to include the panic info type we do use core panic, core panic panic info and then this should make it happy yeah cool so we have created a bare metal project that compiles an elf that has a start symbol and it has a panic symbol. Okay, not a lot really going on here. And there's actually a few issues with this. So if we do object dump on our binary, so it's in target, the build shame name, debug, and then my, uh, my rusty pie. 
If you look at the binary, a couple things are wrong with this. First, the binary has a lot of extra information above it, above the entry point. Because essentially, we're going to take this image that we're creating, we're going to put it on the SD card, plug it into the Raspberry Pi, and it has to run at start. So two things have to happen. One, start needs to be at the beginning of the image, and start also needs to be at hex 8000. Hex 8000 is the base address of images that go onto the Raspberry Pi. That's where they're loaded by the bootloader. So we need to fix this using a linker script. If you've watched my previous videos, I've used a linker script in the past with the bare metal video to make sure that start is loaded at the right address. So we're actually just gonna go ahead and borrow that linker script and add a couple things to it uh, to make sure that it does what we want it to do. So we're gonna go ahead and grab that real quick, link in the description for those that are following along. Call it linker.ld. Okay, and here's the script, again, from a previous video. I'm not gonna walk through this in too much detail, but essentially what we're doing is we say, the entry point is start, that's not super important. The big thing here is we set the base address of the image to hex 8000. And then we say the text segment is next, and then follow on with follow on segments after that. One thing we do need to do is make sure that the start symbol is at the very beginning of this image. Like for example, if I made another function called function foo, let's do, i i32 and it returns an i32 and it returns uh one i plus one or whatever right there is a possibility that at compile time and link time foo gets put above start and then it jumps into foo to start the program we don't want that so we need to use a cool thing called global assembly to make sure that this symbol is put at the beginning of the image we'll do that with the following code so use boot we need to include a cool module called global assembly and global assembly is going to be a macro that we say dot section dot text dot start. And we end this with a semicolon. What this does is it says all the code below me is in the dot text dot start section. And then we can use that section name in the linker file to make sure that it gets included before the rest of the code. So that means that start will come before anything else. We're going to delete this because we don't actually care about this. Okay. So we'll do cargo build again. Nothing will change because we actually need to make sure that we invoke the uh, cargo build chain with our linker script being included. So we'll do the following command to do that. So instead of using cargo build, we're going to say cargo rust C. So this adds a compiler flag and it says we add a link arg that the linker script is equal to our local linker.ld. And we should see nothing that happens here. I want to make it very clear. If you modify the linker script at all, the build chain actually won't run until you delete your targets. What it does is it scans all of your source code and only builds your project if it sees that source code has changed. But if the linker script doesn't change, it's not actually scanning that. So I would say anytime you edit your linker script to prevent yourself from going crazy, uh, delete the target folder. So we're going to actually rm tacrf target folder and then rebuild and then we'll object dump. Oh, hello, object dump. Cool, so now a couple things have happened, things have changed. Uh, first, we have the text section at the beginning of the, uh, the program. The start symbol as, is first, and then also the start symbol is loaded at hex 8000. So perfect, we are, we are golden. The final thing we need to do to make this image usable on the Raspberry Pi is we need to extract away all of the extra information that came with the ELF, right? So if you're familiar with you know Linux programming, when you produce files that get produced as this ELF file, this executable and linkable format that Linux is familiar with, right? Uh, we need to rip the code out of the ELF file and put it into a flat binary file. And the way we do that is actually pretty simple. We're gonna use arm none eabi obj copy, and we're gonna say the output format will be a flat binary. We're going to take in our target file here, my rusty pie, the ELF, we're going to output it locally and call it kernel 7.image. So now if you do a file on this, it's just, okay, this is actually uh, an, an error. It's not real. But if we look at it in XXD, we can tell that it's just flat code. This is actually the ARM instructions for the start function. So that's it. This is all we care about is getting the text out of that, that, that code. Okay, great. So in theory, if we put this kernel seven image on a Raspberry Pi right now, it would run our infinite loop code with start, which not very exciting. So now what we're going to do is we're going to make the code actually turn the Raspberry Pi's pin 21, as I showed you in the schematic before, on and off. So for doing GPIO, we need to consult the Broadcom 2837 ARM peripheral data sheet. When you're doing any kind of embedded programming, you need to figure out what are the addresses that I'm concerned with to make things happen on the chip. 
So looking at the, uh, the data sheet here, and again, link, I'll put this in the description if you want to follow along. Uh, we are mostly concerned with this complicated graphic here. It's really not that bad called the memory map. And essentially it tells us that the IO peripherals for the bus addresses live at this location, but in the actual physical realm, the physical addresses, they live somewhere else. We're not gonna worry about the picture too much, but we are gonna worry about this line here, this gets a lot of people in trouble when they're doing embedded programming. You just need to understand that if the data sheet says this address, 7E, you actually need to use is 3F. It has to do with the way that the buses are set up. The bus address is this, but when you're actually writing to it using data, the physical address, you need to use 3F. Don't worry about that too much, but what we're gonna do now is we're actually gonna read the data sheet and go to the GPIO section, which I believe is on page 89. Yeah, boom, 89, we'll go there right now. Eight, nine. And this is gonna to describe to us how do we use the GPIO interface on the chip to make the pin go on and off, right? A lot of stuff going on here. The only things we care about are going to be the function selectors and the set and the clear, okay? Because the function selectors, if you haven't done embedded programming before, we have to tell the pin to be an output, that's step one. And then step two, we need to set the pin and clear the pin to make the pin go on and off. You know, hot, cold, five volts, ground, whatever you wanna call it. So we need to figure out how do we actually set the pin to be a GPIO pin? So essentially the way that this works is if we wanted to modify pin nine, for example, right? If we wanted it to be an output, we would write one to bits 29 through 27. And so talking about pin 21, we need to do the same thing. We need to write bit one to bits five through three. So essentially removing the one into the third position. So that's what we're gonna do here. And again, that address is probably in the data sheet right here. So what was it? It was three e or seven E two zero 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 eight. So we're gonna copy that. And we're gonna make it a comment. This is going to be our F cell two. And again, remember the three E becomes three F. Okay, so that's step one. That's just, this is to turn the pin, turn pin 21 into an output. Okay, now that it's an output, you know, we'll write the code for that here in a second, but once it's an output, we need to then turn it on, okay? Turn it on, we will do the same thing. Uh, we need to use the output set zero or one. I forget which one it is, we'll go check it out real quick. Okay, so we need to do output register set zero because by setting the nth bit, we turn on that pin. So we want to set the 21st bit, turn on the 21st pin. And that address is where again? We'll check it out on the data sheet here. That's going to live at hex 01C. Okay, so we'll copy this down. 3F20001C. That's going to be GPIO1 set. We're going to set that to pin 21. So again, this turns it into an output. This turns pin 21 on. And then the same thing, we need to turn the pin off using the exact same methodology. So if this is the output set, the output clear lives at 28. 3F200028, GPIO1 clear, 121 turns pin 21 off. Okay, great. So now we need to actually implement this code in Rust. Uh, there are a couple ways we can do this. I'm going to be completely transparent. I'm not going to do it the most clean and efficient way. Uh, but what we're gonna do here is in our, our start function, we're going to do a few things. Uh, unfortunately, all of this code is going to be unsafe. I know some Rust stations may be mad. Leave a comment if you're mad, we'll talk about it. We'll figure it out, okay, not a big deal. Um, so the unsafe code is gonna do a few things. First, we need to you know set the F cell pin to be you know, one left shift by three to turn 21 into an output. So it will do that is we'll use the core pointer right volatile and we'll say hex three F two zero 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 eight as a mutable U32 pointer. And we're going to write the value one left shifted by three. Or, yeah, for this one, it's three. We'll close that off. So comment turn pin 21 into an output. Cool, so what we've done here is we've literally just treated this address as a pointer to a U32 and written this thing here. So now the pin is an output, awesome. So then we're gonna do a loop because this is where we're gonna get into our, our while loop for turning the pin on and off. We're going to do core po uh, pointer write volatile, same exact thing. And we're gonna write to this address here, 
as a mute 32 pointer. We're gonna say left shift 121. And then we can actually just copy this line right here, paste it and set it to 28. And now this will turn the pin on and off. So turn pin on turn pin off so pretty pretty cool uh, the issue here is if we do this this will happen so fast our eyes won't actually be able to see the pin turn on and off so we need to actually include a loop of knops to give a artificial delay uh, in the in the program so we will do that as we'll do another loop we'll do for nothing in one dot dot five thousand or I think it's fifty thousand is good and we'll say use the assembly macro and do nop don't forget to make this work we need to use core arc assembly we can actually just copy and paste this twice so make sure you put a semicolon here and put it at the end now we could do our rust c command again we build it with no issues and let's make sure that in our uh, actual program we object dump it and now there's more code right so i just want to make sure the code actually compiles it gets included because when you're doing linker foo like this sometimes the compiler decides hey you're not going to use that code so we're not going to include it but here in the assembly you'll kind of see it at an extremely high level uh the code turns on we load up the address of the f cell 3f208 and we store eight there which is one left shifted by three so we're, we're good and then we set the pin on do some sleeping we set the pin off so we're all good to go this code should should work so step one to get our code running on our raspberry pi we'll have to do a few things the first one is do the obj copy command again that pulls the text out of the image and puts it into this kernel 7 dot image file here to get it to run on a raspberry pi we'll have to include this kernel 7 dot image as well as three other files to make sure that the program runs based off the way the bootloader expects it on the raspberry pi so we're going to go make a new window we're going to open firefox we're going to go to the raspberry pi firmware folder or firmware at, uh, repo and we're going to download three things from this repo so we'll go to boot we have to download first the fixup.dat file download that start.elf and bootcode.bin so we're going to in our mount folder copy downloads bootcode.bin downloads start.elf and downloads uh what is it fixup.dat copy them here as well as make a new file called config.txt and just say that arm 64-bit equals zero to make sure we tell the bootloader to load into a 32-bit environment Okay, once we have that, we'll then finally copy our my rusty pi kernel 7.image kernel image here. And now with those files available, remove LOL, because that's not relevant. Um, we have the necessary files to get it booted on a Raspberry Pi. So take those files, take a FAT32 formatted uh, SD card, put those files on that SD card, plug it in, and we'll see what happens. Anyway, guys, that's it for now. Thanks for watching. Negative numbers are actually kind of weird. You should go check out this video to figure out how they work. Go, 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 click. Okay, goodbye.